Hello, Congresswoman uh, Lisa Blount Rochester. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be on. Yeah. So to start, um, can you just tell us why you're running for Senate? How did you come to that decision? Well, you know, first of all, I, I love the word democracy that's in the title because um, I think that's sort of one of the foundational things for me. But this actually started uh, back in 1988. I would say my journey into public service started as a grad student at University of Delaware. I went to a town hall meeting and I had my two year old son on my hip. I was pregnant at the time and didn't even know it. And afterwards, I just went up and met the congressman and said, I want to be involved. I want to, you know, help save the world. And uh, he said, you should apply for an internship in our office. We have interns in the congressional office. And that internship um, turned into a career of public service from um, being the intern to a caseworker and helping individuals with their problems with social security disability or um, people who were unhoused. And that went from saying, can't we do more to get people housing instead of putting them on waiting lists? And so I then was responsible for bringing federal dollars to Delaware. He became governor. Um, then I served in his cabinet as deputy secretary of health and social services, as well as secretary of labor, where I got to see just the importance of good jobs and allowing people to live their purpose. Uh, I got to see firsthand the challenges of um, substance abuse disorders. I had seen them from my own family, and now I was seeing it from a policy perspective, health disparities, um, just even helping people to just be able to live their full lives. And so he then uh, left as governor and a new governor came in, our first woman governor in Delaware, Ruth Ann Minner. And she asked me to, to be a member of her cabinet where I served as head of state personnel. It was hiring, firing, training, the hardest job I've ever had in my life. Uh, you know, Secretary of Labor, I was connecting people to jobs and to the economy. This job was about everything from benefits, you named it, name it. And it was during the year of anthrax, 9-11 um, happened during that time. I had to investigate the state police for racial and sexual discrimination during that time. And I turned 40. I mean, like everything happened and I was mm -hmm. like, I need to get a pilgrimage. I need to go away. And I ended up uh, doing an assignment in the country of Jordan um, for King Abdullah's poverty alleviation strategy, where I got a chance to work with the minister of labor there and raise the minimum wage and get women into the workforce. And I came back changed and I ended up changing my job. I went to the nonprofit sector, the Urban League as the CEO. I changed my my, my house, my car, and my husband of 40 years. Everything changed. And I ended up, uh, after a few years, falling in love with the, my soulmate. And he was working in Shanghai. And I ended up moving to Shanghai for a few years and wrote a book with other women. But it was coming home. Um, my husband went on a business trip. And he ruptured his Achilles tendon before meetings. At a, and um, blood clots went to his heart and lungs. And at 52, the love of my life um, passed away. And it shook me to the core. And I remember it like it was yesterday, that whole year, just being on autopilot and being in the supermarket with a dad in front of me and three kids putting back grapes because they were $9. And it just shook me out of my own pain. And it made me recognize, hey, I'm still alive. I can do something. I can serve. And Delaware, my city was being called murder town because of gun violence. Um, I, I decided I have nothing to lose and everything to give, and I'm going to run for office. Having never run for anything in my life, I was debating lawyers. I, 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 people said I look like a deer in the headlights. I was a deer in the headlights because I was scared. Right. But every story propelled me to keep going. And in 2016, we won. I became the first woman elected to Congress from Delaware and the first person of color. And I get to work on issues like clean drinking water, democracy, um, health care, uh, supply chains, even jobs. And uh, that's that sort of propelled me to this place. But the Senate is an opportunity to do it in a deeper level, to work on reproductive freedom and to also work for democracy kind of circling back to the beginning of your question. This moment is truly about our democracy. 
Definitely. And I want to discuss some specific cases in Delaware with you. But first, I just want to ask what, you know, as a congresswoman, what have you done to protect democracy? And as a senator, what would you continue to do to protect us? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, I think it's important to show up and participate. And so whether it's me when I worked on campaigns or me running myself, I feel that's a part of my democratic responsibility and duty. In Congress, I've been able to be at the table for some of the most consequential pieces of legislation and co-sponsor them and vote for them, like the For the People Act, you know, led by John Sarbanes or the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, I've been able, when that bill was up for this in the Senate side, because we passed our bills in the House when Democrats were in control. When it was up in the Senate, I joined members and walked across the Capitol to be in that chamber to show our presence as well. And I got to do that with John Lewis himself. I mean, I was really fortunate and blessed to not only be with him as he advocated for these bills, but to even stand on the John stand on the Edmund Pettus Bridge with him. And it's one of the reasons why this is so important to me. So whether it is passing legislation, whether it is stepping up myself, Or even in this present moment, as I think about the Senate, you know, I know that um, some people might know on January 6th, I was one of the people trapped up in the gallery. I saw how close we were to losing it. I mean, I could hear the gunshot on one side. I could see down on the other side, Capitol Police barricading that door and we could hear the banging. And all I could do in that moment was pray But I also will tell you in that moment and the year after, I recommitted to our democracy because I just know how important it is. And so in the Senate, I will fight for voting rights. I will fight for our reproductive freedoms. This is the first time freedoms are taken away from us, particularly women. And so for me, um, those things are the things that I've done, but I want to do more in the Senate. I want to ask you about um, a case in February, a Delaware Superior Court struck down laws allowing at least 10 days of early voting and allowing certain eligible voters to apply for permanent absentee status. How do you think that this ruling is going to affect voters in November? And and what is the true effect of this? Yeah, I mean, what a great question. I mean, first of all, there's the there is the effect in Delaware and there's the effect nationally. Mm -hmm. I mean, nationally, people need to see this as a like an alarm. You know, many people consider Delaware, they they don't think of Delaware as a state where, uh, you know, um, extreme Republicans are trying to take away rights. But even in Delaware, where we were able to get absent early, early voting, as well as, um, as you mentioned, permanent absentee voting passed here. And now they have sued to be able to take that right away. And so our attorney general, as well as members of our legislature, are fighting to make sure that we restore it. But when you think about it, what the impact is, is people who may be working people and don't have flexibility, individuals with disabilities, the fact that every time they want an absentee ballot, they've got to go back and redo. I mean, that's it's it's crazy, you know people in the armed services, part of this effort, I think, is to diminish and and really, um, really uh, depress voter turnout. And what we're saying is that we need to be more open, more possibilities for people to vote, not less. I, again, I think about how this is what's happening in Delaware, but we're only one of four states now where you've got to go on election day. It's us, New Hampshire, Mississippi, and Alabama. So to me, part of what we're doing, again, is fighting to make sure that we, I just was on the phone recently with our attorney general with her efforts to appeal this decision, but also our legislators who are working as well. And what we're going to do as a campaign is we're going to even ramp up even more. We're going to make sure that we are enfranchising as many, that everybody knows how can you vote, how can we get you to vote, and make sure that we spread the word, you know, so that people will come out and vote in the in the meantime. 
but we're going to fight. We're going to continue to fight for more access and not less. Right. And there's another case I want to ask you about as well. Um, a lawsuit was filed in December against the governor and other state officials arguing that people incarcerated in the state who are detained awaiting trial or been convicted of a you know non-disqualifying misdemeanor are eligible voters, but the state is disenfranchising them. You know, like, what is your... What are your thoughts on this? And, and again, what kind of effect do you think this will have on voters? Yeah, I mean, again, our goal should be if you are eligible to vote, we need to make sure that you have access to the ballot. Um, you know, to me, it, it it is one of those things that I think people, you know, I heard somebody say it's 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 one of those things like you got to do it you know it's it's like you know whether it's doing the dishes or whatever you got to do it it's part of what what is important but if we take away the ability for you to do it that's a problem if we say you can't go early and vote and have flexibility especially for those working parents like delaware people might not know but we are we're we're, we're only three counties you know and we vote blue purple and red we are urban, suburban, rural, and coastal. And so we have a lot of folks who live in rural areas of our state as well. Again, to the extent that if you are, whether you are in a rural area or whether you are in prison, if you are eligible to vote, we should be making more opportunities for you to vote. And again, that's part of what we will be doing is getting the word out for people to know how they can exercise this fundamental right that is also the equalizer. You, you get one vote, you know, whether you're a gazillionaire or, or, or whether you don't have means. And so for us, we want people to see their connection to the vote, connection from clean water to the vote, connection from your reproductive freedoms to your vote. And so our goal is to encourage people and to motivate them and to give them the, the, the actual opportunities to vote. And now I just want to ask you, so your potential Republican opponent, Eric Hansen, has a section on his website titled Defending Democracy, and it only focuses on protecting democracy abroad and foreign threats. So I want to ask you, if you had a section on your website called Defending Democracy, what would be included? What would you say in that? Mm. Well, first of all, some of the things that I just said to you, that this mm -hmm. is such a precious right, and we want to help people to exercise it. That, that's number one. It is also, for me, the reason why I supported the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Advancement Right Act is because one is dealing with, you know, historic discrimination in places and ways that people have been tried, have, you know, have risked disenfranchisement. And the other is dealing with things like access, like, you know, same day res registration, um, access, ways like we were talking about early voting, more opportunities for people to vote, but also voter protection from intimidation. I mean, the fact that we've got a former president and his folks that have made people even afraid to work at polls. For me, as we look at democracy, we want to make the tent bigger, not smaller. We want to have all of us have this right to be exercised. And, you know, on the day that I was um, sworn in to Congress, I knew it was going to be a special day. Be you know, we were making Delaware history and I, I wanted to wear something special or carry something special. Um, and and you, you might have seen um, my sister found a document that allowed our great, great, great grandfather who had been enslaved to have the right to vote. And it was a document, we turned it into a scarf that I carried on the day that I was sworn in. It's the Returns of Qualified Voters and Reconstruction Oath from 1867. On the bottom is an X. He couldn't even read or write, but he marked his X to have this precious freedom. And I carried this scarf with me on the day that I was sworn in I also had this scarf with me on the day of the insurrection. And people ask, what's the best day I've had in Congress? And what's the worst? It's the same day. It was the worst day because we saw people with Confederate flags storming our Capitol and trying to take away this incredible democracy we have. But it was the best day because we went back in in the morning, two or three in the morning, and we certified the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. 
And so for me, what is on that page is the vision of all of us, more of us coming together in a, 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 in a democratic way to exercise our right to vote and to participate. That's, that, that to me, protecting those freedoms and protecting those rights is really what this moment is about. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, now, I wanted to end with kind of a fun question. So okay. I saw online that your first job was at a McDonald's in Wilmington, Delaware. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what is your go to McDonald's order? Oh, this is a this is a really bad question. I'm really mad you asked <laughs> okay. this because my my team will tell you I literally have to have a little bit of everything. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll get okay. I'll go small. I'll start with like a happy meal of like, you know, maybe the cheeseburger and fries, but then I got to add some nuggets to it. And then on the cheeseburger, I might ask for some like um, Big Mac sauce and some lettuce because I used to work there and I would make Little Macs instead of Big Macs. So I've mm -hmm. got my little things about McDonald's that I do. And uh, it, it's funny, I, we were just in an airport recently and and I said, I'm going to have to go to McDonald's. I can't, I can't figure out from these restaurants here. And they're like, oh, you feel so bad about that, don't you? So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do have my, my, I can even do the old jingle for those who are old enough to know the Big Mac jingle. I still know it in my heart. So thanks well, for that go. question. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, of course. Of course. All right. Well, thank you, Congresswoman, so much for taking the time to join us today at Democracy Docket. Thank you so much. And thanks for the work that you're doing to save democracy. Take care.